Um, my name's Putty Putman. If you've never heard of me before, you're probably asking yourself, is that his real name? Um, and the answer is, uh, well, it kind of depends, I suppose, on, on who you ask. If you were to ask the U.S. government, they would not say that's my real name. No, that's not what's on my birth certificate. Uh, that would be Robert, if you're curious. Um, but it comes as a prophetic word, actually. One of the first ever prophetic words that I got. I didn't even know it to be prophecy at the time because I wasn't in a, in a church environment that did that prophecy thing. Um, but my youth pastor looked at me and he said, I see that you're like putty in God's hands. And he takes you and he molds you into what he needs and then he sticks you somewhere. And then he takes you and he remolds you and he sticks you somewhere else. And so for a while I thought, oh, that's kind of that's interesting. That's sort of different. Um, we can go by that as a nickname. And then it eventually became something that when I met the Holy Spirit realized was more than a nickname. Because this is what Jesus does to us. He calls us something and he calls out in us something. Um, we see him doing that with Peter. We see him doing that with Abraham and other characters in the Bible. And I just feel benefited enough, I suppose, that I got that a little bit early. Turns out we all get that in heaven. Um, but maybe uh, I got so lucky as to get it a bit early, which is probably why it's silly. So um, I, uh, I'm a vineyard pastor from the States. I, I've been in ministry since about 2010. And uh, for about 10 years, I ran a thing called the School of Kingdom Ministry, which was a, we've got a few School of Kingdom Ministry graduates in here. Um, it's a, a Holy Spirit ministry training thing that was hosted by churches all over, um, trained and equipped people in the power of the Holy Spirit. And so I did that for about 10 years. And then when COVID landed, like all of us, my life got a little disrupted. And in the middle of that disruption, God invited me to begin a new adventure. And so I'm preparing to go church plant. I'm hoping in the next six months or so to relocate across um, from Chicago, where I am presently at, over to Phoenix in the southwest of the states and begin a church adventure there. Um, I'm excited for this weekend, not just because I love to be in a big room with people worshiping and praying and those kinds of things. I'm excited about that, of course. Um, but I think that events like this and moments like this are so important, particularly in our increasingly post-Christian environment. We're not going to get a lot out there that's going to reinforce the spiritual journey that we're on. And so these moments where we can come together and these moments where we can, we can open up space, as it were, and we can say, God, we have, we have cleared the day. And in fact, I'm going to clear my heart. I'm going to invite you, come do anything you want to do in my life. What I found is that a day like that can change my life more than a year of me giving my best effort. And that's really what I, I'm asking God for this weekend, is that we have a time together that's uh, hopefully fun, yes. Hopefully, you know, we, we have powerful times of connecting with one another and those kinds of things. Lot, all, that's all good, right? But what I'm really hoping is that God encounters us in unique and powerful and life-changing ways this weekend. That's my prayer. And so to, to kind of begin to, to give, a, I suppose, a little bit of a frame to that, I want to tell you a little bit of my story. Now, we've got a, a theme um, for our event, which is not my will, but yours be done. And um, I know I saw like a promo video. I don't know, are we going to show the promo video this weekend? Is that not part of the agenda? Not, not part of the agenda. There was a great promo video. You could go online and watch it. I think it's on the conference website. Um, but the theme of the conference is not my will, yours be done. And you may have heard those words before. Those are good Bible-sounding words, aren't they? That sounds like a good, um, a good set of words, a good thing to maybe pray. And so as I was preparing for a conference, I thought, you know, maybe it would be good to start by actually revisiting those words in the Bible. And those words um, come, come out in the biblical story in Luke 22. And so I'm going to read that passage here real quick as we kind of dive in for today and for the weekend. In uh, Luke chapter 22, um, if you want, you can swipe and read along with me, Luke twenty two forty one, 41, or you can just listen. I wasn't clever enough to send my slides in in advance, so you won't see them on the screens. Um, but Luke 22, verse 41, Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane. 
He's just done the Last Supper. He's done all of those things. And this is that pivot point to where things are going to get real uncomfortable real quick for him. And it says this, as, as Jesus is sort of like entering into that. First, he grabs his disciples and he says, hey, guys, um, pray. This isn't going to be fun. Pray for me. Actually, pray for yourselves, too. This isn't going to be hard for me. This is going to be hard for all of us. And so he asks the disciples to pray, and then it says this. He withdrew from them about a stone's throw, and he knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if you're willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And there appeared to him an angel from heaven strengthening him. Wow, that's pretty intense. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. This is a moment where Jesus is struggling. Those are pretty unique moments. Like, as you read the story of the scriptures, at least, you know, as I read it, doesn't it kind of usually feel like Jesus is mostly kind of sailing above all the problems, right? Right? You know, he's the one asleep in the boat, all the other disciples, professional fishermen and boats, navigator people or whatever, they're, they're panicking like we're going to die. And Jesus is like, ah, oh, just so proud, just chill out, problem solved. He's the one who, you know, the guy running up with a legion of demons, right, who's strong enough to break stones and all this. Everybody's afraid. The guy runs up to Jesus. He's like, oh yeah, let's just, let's just cast those demons out of you. No problem. And this is the moment where even Jesus, who seems like he's sailing above most of it, even Jesus is caught in the middle of it because he knows this is about to be really tough. And he prays, an interesting prayer, right? He's like, he's not dishonest with God, which I love. He's not like, God, you know, it's all gonna be so worth it. I'm just gonna like tell myself it's gonna be worth it to get through this thing. He's like, God, I, I don't know if there's a plan B, but if there is one, like I'd really like to not do this next part. This is gonna be really tough. But if there's not a plan B, if this is the only way forward, then not my will, yours be done. Jesus prays this prayer in this incredible posture of surrender, of letting go, of sacrifice. And it says that there does appear to be an angel who shows up and strengthens him. And yet, at the same time, even with an angel strengthening him, as he's praying, it's so intense that his sweat becomes like these big just drops of blood on the ground. This is an intense moment, even for Jesus. And what I want to talk about today, and I want to reflect on, is the fact that sometimes the kingdom asks hard things of us. Sometimes there are moments when it's like, you know... I feel like there might be an easier way. <laughs> you know, this is really actually going to cost a lot. And sometimes the kingdom asks those moments. Sometimes the kingdom asks that even of Jesus. Meaning, it's not like Jesus, you know, was working through some sin issue that was his own fault. <laughs> right? <laughs> he didn't have any of those. <laughs> he didn't cause any of his own problems. And yet... The kingdom positions him in this intense place. Sometimes, not my will is your, but yours be done. What I want to ask today is this. Is the kingdom really worth those moments? Is it really worth that, that level of sacrifice? Because sacrifice is not a thing that is like living so much in our culture anymore. Right? Like, we'll talk more about this as we go, but like, by and large, it sure looks to me that the, the sort of way that our, our Western culture is working out is it's sort of like over the last, I don't know, 40, 50 years has navigated into this, this sort of like numb yourself kind of capitalism that we're all soaking in all the time. 
Our, our world has sort of displaced the idea that there's anything transcendent, that there's anything that exists above the world, that there's, there's anything that's like eternal or, or has value that, that goes beyond the world that we live in right here, right now, that we can see and taste and touch and feel and put on a scale. And with the loss of that transcendence, what's happened is there's become this sort of like gaping hole inside of us that's meant to connect to that. Something that's meant to find the meaningful, the real, the significant, the purposeful. But once we cut that off from our society, what happens is our culture says, well, we have to fill that hole. And you know what we're going to do? We're going to fill it with all kinds of great Instagram filters and craft coffee lattes and amazing experiences. And so we've become this sort of like micro numb yourself culture that we live in all the time. We get constant hits from our phones and from whatever, and all of it is actually numbing the fact that we're empty inside and keeping us to the point where we don't even feel it. And the idea of sacrifice cuts against all of that. Because the continual message that we hear is this, you can have everything you need right now if you just blank. If you'll just spend this money on that. If you'll just identify with this group. If you'll just, whatever it is, you can have it, you can feel full, you can be satisfied. Numbed, not really satisfied is a little more accurate. And against the grain of that, the kingdom sometimes comes to us and says, you know what, maybe I'm going to ask you to give something up. Maybe I don't want you to feel full. Maybe I don't want you to feel that hit of dopamine or whatever it is that we get on our phones that numbs us. Maybe there's an emptiness that you're supposed to embrace instead of a satisfying, filling your own life with whatever. This is the world that we're living in and the kingdom cuts against the grain of it. And so is the sacrifice of the kingdom really worth it? This is a completely countercultural trajectory. <laughs> well, I'm here to tell you that at least in my experience, and we'll look at the scriptures too, but at least in my experience, I will tell you, yes, it is worth it. I grew up um, in the church, not, not a, a vineyard church. I grew up in a um, what, what we would call a more Bible-based evangelical expression of faith. And I always loved Jesus, and it was really significant. It was really powerful. And I grew up deeply involved in the church in a lot of ways because my dad, by the way, my dad's actually here. Wave, Dad. <laughs> That's my dad. I dragged him to the UK because we have British blood, and he studied British literature in college and all of that. My wife's name is Brittany, by the way, so I'm, like, practically married to the island. Um, <laughs> The, uh, um, where was I? My dad worked for uh, a, a, our denomination. And so I was always around all kinds of church stuff. And growing up, I considered, you know, should I go into ministry? Should I not? And the conclusion I came to was this. When I was in high school, I, I thought about all the pastors I'd interacted with. And I realized this. I was like, none of them look like they're having any fun. <laughs> they all have gray hair. They all look like life is just heavy and hard all the time. Like, most of them are balding early. Like, I don't, I just, I don't know that that's what I need. None of them get paid enough. None of them, like, I, I just don't need that. And so I decided I wasn't going to go into ministry. And when I, when I was in high school, um, I bumped into physics. And it turned out that I was quite good at it. Um, which was a complete surprise to me. I didn't expect to be good at it. And as soon as I say that, some set of people go like, oh, you must be super smart. I'm good at physics. I'm not good at a lot of stuff. So don't think, like, I'm a weird shape. Don't think I'm Einstein. I'm not Einstein. I just have a niche. And so, so anyway, I took physics, and I was, like, ridiculously good at it. So I said, maybe this is the way I'll go. So I go to my undergrad. I dominate my undergrad, completely destroy it. And I'm like, this is cool. Um, so I'm talking to the professors, and I'm like, I'd like to learn some more. I've been thinking about going to grad school. Do you think I can do grad school? They go, oh, yeah, you can totally do grad school. 
So I apply and I take all these exams and everything, and I, and I wind up attending University of Illinois, which is, in the United States, a, a top 10 physics school, and in some areas, it's number one in the world. It's a very, very, very good physics school. And I go there, and I uh, sign up in a PhD program. And while I'm there, um, I, I step in um, not doing, uh, I step in with some ketchup. I'll just put it that way, because I went to a Christian university, and now I'm in against people who have been to Cambridge and Oxford and MIT and Caltech and all of this, and so I'm like, oh, you guys are a little ahead of me. But it takes me about two years. I catch up with all of them. I pass most of them. And by the time I complete my degree, I'm probably the most awarded student in my graduating class. I am crushing physics. (laughs) And I am set up for a really good physics career. Now, you may or may not know this, physicists don't get paid exorbitant amounts of money, but they do get paid pretty well, and here's why. At least in the United States, I don't know if this is true, at le- here, at least in the United States, Wall Street firms hire more physicists than anything else. Because what Wall Street does is the physics of the stock market. And so they hire physicists and pay them half a million dollars a year or more, because They're the best people at figuring this kind of thing out. And so that sets the wage for physicists at a respectable amount. Let's just put that that way. So this is my background. And in the middle of this, I find myself, through some friends, going to this goofy kind of church I've never heard of before called the Vineyard. At least (laughs) that's what I assumed it was called. Because in the, like, tradition that I grew up in, like, I couldn't imagine you would name a church after something that makes alcohol. I just thought, like... (laughs) That can't be right, like there's no way. And so I read the sign and I said, vineyard, even though it's clearly vineyard. Um, and so I find myself at this goofy vineyard church and this is my first experience like with anything charismatic. I'm not used to any of this. And um, I, I show up and I, and I tend, and it's not like an amazing experience for me. I'm like, this is weird, these people are weird, they're worshiping weird. And then at the end, they're praying really weird. Like, I, I just, I don't think I'm here for that. And so I wind up continuing to attend because I had some friends there, but I was not open to the, to the vineyard way of doing church. And what winds up happening is, over a number of years, I sort of, my first, my first, um, my first attendance service that I attended, I was, I'm going to point at somebody here in the audience because I'm American. Everybody here, this guy right here in the black t-shirt with the awesome black glasses, I was seated right about there. That's where I was. Wave your hand, okay? The next week I show up and I sit the same place but a row back. The next week I move another row back. And before long, I'm sitting in the very back of the church, now like back where these guys are at this table back here or whatever. And every service I go to, I end the service like this, (laughs) judging everything that's happening. It was pretty bad, but Baptists are good at judging, so you gotta you gotta do what you can do, I guess. So (laughs) I'm so glad I was Baptist growing up. Just just FYI. Um, Okay, so this is my this is my upbringing, and I attend this church every week because I was a good Baptist, judging every single week for four years. Four years. Um, And of course, I'm like spending a lot of my time and energy in physics grad school. So I'm just like, I got people who are reminding me that I know Jesus. That's really what I need, right? That's my biggest thing out of this. So four years in, I wind up having this bizarre experience, which I would love to tell you the whole story, but I like can't do justice to the whole story in shorter than 20 minutes. And I don't have 20 minutes to share that part. So here's the highlights. I wind up going on a short-term mission trip to China to work with like the underground church, basically. It's totally awesome, unbelievable experience. Um, I went because we had lived in China for a year growing up. They were missionaries and I was like eight and I'm watching them disciple people knowing if they get caught, they're going to prison. I mean, it was crazy. And so I'm like, always wanted to go back. I go back and I attend the trip making the deal in advance I totally want to go on this trip, but I got to be honest, I'm not into that prayer thing you guys do. So if we get to any of those prayer moments, like maybe you guys do that and I won't. Can we do that? And and the team leader goes, deal, that sounds perfect. So I'm like, okay, good. I'm excused. That sounds good. I can do that. So I go to China 
we're, we're having a trip, unbelievable experience. We get to a, a training that we're doing where I've already made this deal where I'm not supposed to pray. But while the team leader is, gives a space for all of us to listen to God, God tricks me and talks to me without me realizing he's talking to me. So I kind of throw it out there, and then the team leader's like, great, that's God. You get to lead the prayer time in front of everybody. <laughs> and I'm like, what? Like, I don't, I don't even do this. And so after swallowing my pride, I decide, literally, to go up and just, like, fake it. Because I've seen them do it hundreds of times. I don't believe it, but I've seen it. And so I'm like, I know how you do it. You know, you put your hand on the shoulder, and you talk at the person. And then you say, stay in faith. You'll get healed later, maybe, you know. And so, <laughs> you know that that's what we do. Sometimes, sometimes it works, right? But so, so I'm, I'm doing it and I'm walking through it and I get to that part where I pray that like come Holy Spirit thing, which I've heard everybody say. I don't know why. For some reason, that's how Vineyard people start praying. It's weird. I mean, it's like, he's in the room. Why are we already saying that? But whatever. So I say come Holy Spirit and the Lord shows up and blows that room apart. She drops to the ground, full-on manifesting a demon, twisting, contorting, snarling at me. The room that's around a circle watching, half of them, thump, 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 thump. And they start shaking and frying and all this. And they're new to all this. They've never seen any of this before. And so this isn't like a conditioned response or this happens every time. They're all like, what's happening? And I'm like, you have no idea. Like, I don't even believe this. And <laughs> like, this is absolutely crazy. So one thing leads to another, she gets delivered, she gets healed, it's crazy, I'm stunned, I come back, and I've got a lot of rethinking to do from my last two years of graduate school. And I decide, I'm like, that was messy and weird, I don't know about all that packaging, but I do know that God totally changed that woman's life in that prayer time. And if that's true, I want to figure out more about that. Like, if God's actually doing real, concrete, tangible things... I need, to, I need to learn about that. And so I kind of begin to explore, and what happens is I start just kind of grabbing some friends and trying some prayer stuff, and, and, and one thing leads to another. It turns out now I'm leading a small group, training people to pray for healing. I never really meant to, but it just kind of like happened. And, and then God starts like sending people to our group, like miraculously, crazy stuff starts happening. And then, and then the group has enough people that we have to multiply. And then we have two groups doing this. And then those groups both keep growing and eventually have to multiply. And so by the time I, I defend and I complete my degree two years later, there's like a hundred people caught up in this thing. And it's like, if you go here, you will see God heal people through you, or you will see people drive out demons, you will learn to prophesy, like, just, just go, just, like, try it, I dare you, like, go ahead. And at this point, what winds up happening is I realize I have an unexpected choice. Because I can do one of two things. If I continue with physics, which I'm really well set up to do, I'm gonna to have to do probably two postdocs, which I don't really have any ability to control where in the world said postdocs are, and then I have to try and find some tenure track faculty position. So I'm looking at like three random moves within the next decade to begin to set up my physics career, all of which I have no ability to control where I go and no real ability to find whatever I stumbled into here in the first place. So like that's what that path looks like. And this path looks like I don't see anything down that road. But here's the one thing I can see. Is that if I keep going with physics, God will bless that. That'll fine. I don't think that's sin. But what I do know is this. Five years down that road, I'm going to turn around and I'm going to look at myself and I'm going to say, I'm the guy who left when God was moving. I'm the guy that somehow stumbled my way right in the middle of God sweeping people up into this thing. And sure, I can distract myself for five years, but then I bet after five years, I'm going to regret that probably for the rest of my life. And I feel caught 
because I don't have any direction here. It's not like anyone's coming to me and being like, you get to be a pastor if you drop physics. I didn't know that was coming. All I knew was I can continue on this career that I've spent 10 years establishing and I've risen to the top of the game in. Or I can choose to stay in the middle of something God's doing. Well, you can guess by the fact that I'm here which of those two that I chose. And it was terrifying. I'd burn all those bridges before God showed up with the next provision. But you know what? He did. I wound up getting hired at our church to oversee healing, of all things. How cool is that, right? And a year later, we start this class called School of Kingdom Ministry with God breathes on, and next thing we know, a couple of years later, churches are coming to us saying, oh my gosh, we need to do more of this. Will you help us do this? And it turns from a little class I'd started in our church with 50 people to the next year there's 100 people in five churches to the next year there's 300 people in 20 churches to the next year there's like six or 700, 800, 900, more than 1,000 a year. It's just going boom, 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 all over the U.S., all over other countries and stuff too. And it goes, I didn't see any of it coming. I had no idea. I'm like, wow, this is so cool. What an unbelievable adventure. And I'll tell you what, I never, and you need to hear, I, you need to hear this. Don't hear this because, don't hear this through me. Hear this through what I'm pointing to. I gave up my physics career in 2010. So it's been 12 years now. I have never for one second regretted it. Never thought a second time about it. Never been like, oh, if only. Not one second. Now, don't hear that and think, oh, Putty's really amazing. <laughs> I'm not saying I didn't. What I'm saying is that thing was so good <laughs> for 12 years that the hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars that I've given up, not for one second seemed tempting. That's how good the kingdom is. Not how good I am, whatever. The only difference between me and you is I've got a bad accent and a weird name. <laughs> <laughs> That's how good the kingdom is. So 10 years into all of that, we hit this weird COVID thing. And the Lord says, hey, how about you give all that up and we start something new? I was like, really, God? We're doing this again? <laughs> Could, is there any other way? <laughs> you know, not my will, but okay, yours be done. And so laid all that down, passed it all away. Find myself like weeks later leading a church of 25 people. None of them even like me. <laughs> And they're not interested in the kingdom. And they don't want the things that I have to bring. <laughs> and I do that for a year, and that's a whole story. And now I'm beginning to, you know, head off to Phoenix and plant a church. And I'm thrilled about that. But I'll tell you what, it's not like I've got some amazing resolution to the thing that God asked me to give up. Laid down an international ministry for nothing. Absolutely nothing. Except, I mean, I get to be here. That's pretty cool. But, you know... <laughs> And you know what? I don't regret it either. I don't even have the end of the story yet. It's fine. Because here's the thing. When the kingdom gets you, no cost is too high. When it gets in your life, not, not, not when you're reaching toward it, Right? If I'm like, it's out there somewhere and I'm trying to find it, then there's going to be plenty of costs that feel too high. But when the kingdom of God comes into your life and you're disrupted and you're like, well, I'm going this way and all of a sudden, bang, God's crashed into my life. You know what the response is? Is that when the kingdom acts on you, it's so powerful that nothing else appeals anymore. Jesus puts it this way in his beautiful 
brief parable in Matthew 13, which I just think is such a beautiful and powerful thing. It says this, Matthew 13, 44, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up, and then in his joy, he sells all that he has and buys the field. Not reluctantly, not He grit his teeth and did it because it was the right thing to do. And I get it. I have those moments too, right? But I'm just saying this. What if if the price feels too high, maybe that's the indicator that the kingdom hasn't crashed in on my life all the way yet. That's kind of a challenging thought. But if the price feels too high, maybe I haven't experienced enough of the kingdom. Because what Jesus says is if you really bump into the kingdom with joy, you'll sell all you have. You won't think twice about it. There won't be a sacrifice that actually feels like a sacrifice. It just feels like an investment. And if we're smart, investments usually don't feel painful, right? Because it's like, well, I'm going to put a a thousand quid in now to get 5,000 later. I'm not really losing here, (laughs) right? I'm investing. When the kingdom has come crashing into our life, sometimes we make kingdom investments. And does it mean that something moves out of my life now? Yes, but you're not losing anything. You're actually gaining so much more. Because what God does And this thing, to kind of circle back to where we started, what God does with this whole sacrifice thing is he cuts against the grain of our culture and he makes us do something really unnatural because he's really clever and he knows a lot of things that we don't know. I I have this, this bad habit. Is this water for me, by the way? All right. That's great. I've got this bad habit that I'll tell you about in one second. (laughs) Where, and and you probably have the same bad habit too. You just maybe either haven't seen it or aren't honest about it yet, and that's okay. I have this bad habit where I assume without realizing I'm assuming it that I'm pretty much done. Like, 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 I'm, I'm, like, pretty close to Jesus, you know? Like, I'm not, not, am I perfect? Of course I'm not perfect. Like, I couldn't say that, you know? But I'm, like, 90% of the way there. Now, when I say that, it sounds horrible. And it is horrible to say that. But here's the thing. When God's working in my life, what I always assume, without realizing I'm assuming, is when God asks something of me, that I'm already ready to do it. That like, God's like, hey, buddy, let's do this. And I'm like, I think if God says let's do this, that I'm ready to do it. And that's because I think that I'm mostly done. But the truth is, is God's not confused about that, right? <laughs> he's, he's, not, he's not thinking the same thoughts I'm thinking about how close I am to Jesus, right? He knows I've got a long, 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 long way to go. And so what God does is he buries the transformation in the call that he gives us. He calls us to something that's beyond where we're at, not at where we're at. And in in doing that, what what it means is, is that our obedience is formational. It's not just transactional. It's not like God's like, well, I need something done down there. Oh, Putty's close enough. Sure, yeah, Putty will do that. You know, that's not what's happening. What God's doing is he's saying like, I'm gonna call him here because he's gonna need to grow up into the assignment that I'm giving him. He's actually not there yet. And the way he's gonna get there is not just like the spiritual disciplines and things, which I'm a huge fan of and are really important to our growth. But another part of it is that he calls us to an obedience that's ahead of us. 
And in that, he forms us while we're living out the mission that he's calling us to. This is like the way that God does it. And so what that means is, is that very often when God starts acting in your life, he's going to ask you for something bigger than you. And that's actually a good sign. In fact, I would say, if you're facing something that you believe is God and it doesn't feel bigger than you, I would say, I'm not saying that's not God, but it's a bit of a tick against it in my mind. It's like, oh, you think you can already do that? Well, maybe it's God. Maybe it's just you. So God calls us to this stuff that's ahead of us, right? And, and one of the major elements of that is this thing called sacrifice. Because what God does in sacrifice, the way he works is, he says this, it's so countercultural. He says, I want you to take a place in your life and I want you to create a hole there. And on purpose, I want you to create a hole and I want you to be willing to hold that hole open and have me fill it instead of you. And so God says, would you give this up? Would you give this career up? Would you give that relationship up, which isn't healthy? Would you give that pattern up? Would you give that hobby up? Would you give that whatever? He says, would you give that up? And when we do give it up of our own choice, it's a loss to us. But if we're willing to stand there in the middle of the loss and hold the hole open in our life, it's an opportunity that God actually comes in and fills in a new way. And that's the way he changes us. Because the thing that he's asked me to give up is actually a space in my life that his fingerprints aren't on yet. And so he says, hold this open. Like, come to a place of actual need where people look at you and go, that's not healthy. That's the kind of sacrifice that God uses powerfully. Jesus looking at the widow, right, who comes up. She drops her two pennies in. Jesus goes, everybody else contribute out of, their, out of the overflow. She's the one worth emulating. Why? She put in everything she had to live on. She gave into a place of need. Everybody else just gave out of abundance. The kingdom will sometimes put you in a place where you have the choice to obey and it brings you into a kind of deficit, actually. That is such a good place. The world will never send you there. The world, the world will not do that. It'll say, don't do that, don't become unhealthy. Self-care, hashtag self-care. Go get yourself another latte. You need, you need a spa, you need a massage, watch Dr. Phil, right? Read B'nai Brown, right? <laughs> And let me just clarify, I like a good latte, okay? Like I'm not, <laughs> right? And there's a lot of wisdom, you know, in, 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 in many of those things, right? But the point is this, is the world will always tell you, fill yourself up. It will never tell you, make yourself empty and hold the empty open until God fills it. That's the way of the kingdom. Only the kingdom does that. Because on, that only makes sense from a kingdom point of view. To say, this space is reserved because I believe God will come. That is such a beautiful, powerful thing. And what I'm here to tell us all today is this. I, don't, I haven't done that perfectly by any means. But I've done it enough <laughs> that I can come here and I can tell you guys, guys, that's real. It's a real thing. <laughs> It's a real thing to open a hole in your life and to say, God, would you come and fill this up? And I'm gonna stand here in the place of need where I have nothing and I feel the hole in my life and I'm gonna hold it open and I'm gonna let you work in this place, God. And if you'll do that, God will come to you. And what you'll find is that your life can be radically different than this game where we like fill ourselves with all of this other stuff and we, we actually create this sort of like numb shell of an existence 
that's constantly caught up with all of the stuff outside and is empty of anything internal that's meaningful. There is a life out there that is good and real and meaningful and eternal that doesn't leave you numb, that doesn't play the advertising game with your life all the time and doesn't do those things. Guys, I'm here to tell you that place is real. And it really is worth giving everything up for. There really is no cost too high to pay. And if you really lay your hands on it, you will not for a second regret what it is that you've given up. Because you'll find that you're way more full than you ever were empty. You'll find that when God fills that space, what seemed like it was a hole this big, when God fills, it feels like a presence of God that big. And you'll realize, like, oh my gosh, this can be my life. I didn't even know. And the best part, the best part, is that's who God is to all of us. Not just to the goofy guy on the stage. I mean, <clears throat> good-looking American on the stage. <laughs> Not just to the person on your left and on your right not just to whoever you look up to or whatever it is. That's who God is to you. Don't shy away from the cost. Don't hide from the kingdom sacrifice. You'll find that it's actually the most beautiful interchange in your life if you'll let the Lord make it with you.